thank you for agreeing to meet with us. Um, we'll start with the topic of essay meals. So you've spoken out against the use of essay meals. Um, do you think the university should take a more active role against these? So we do quite a lot of active work at the moment, of course, in terms of trying to, to check through and looking for uh, the, the science of plagiarism and so on. Um, we're quite clear in terms of penalties that it's a really bad thing to get caught doing this, really, really bad. It's going to have a major impact on people's, uh, people's degrees and so on. Uh, and we've spoken out against it as well. So in a sense, I mean, we can try and push a little bit more on those. I'm not sure there's much more we can do as an individual institution. I think what's really important now is that universities come together and ideally get a little bit of government support uh, for taking the next collective step against, uh, against the SMLs. I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously becoming a really big business. Um, and obviously it has the enormous ability to, to threaten the integrity of, uh, of university degrees over the future. So it's a really big and important issue for us. But, but working together, I think, is probably the next big step. The statement was one part of that, but there's going to be um, a few more activities of that sort just to try and get more focus on this and hopefully get the government to take it as something that they need to take some responsibility for as well, rather than saying universities can solve it all on, on their own. Rob? Uh, we're going to go on to a question about transport. Uh, this year, there have been many complaints from students about the level of overcrowding on buses, both from Leamington in the morning and from campus in the evening. So you've probably seen some pictures of queues of students stretching all the way to the piazza. Um, how is the university working with the Stagecoach and National Express to mitigate these issues? So, not only have I seen the pictures, I've been down there and seen the queues. And um, unfortunately, as you all well know, this has been a, a, an issue which has grown over the last few years. Um, and we do have formal meetings with the, with the bus companies um, and we do make the obvious cases to the bus companies. Um, we also lobby very hard with the, the local authorities all around us as well, in Contrary but also in Warwick District and in Warwick Shear, which is the Transport Authority. Um, so, how do we get beyond it? Because we need to put pressure on now, but we also need to be able to get beyond it. And I think what we need to do is work very hard at creating alternative transport opportunities for people coming from Leamington and going back to Leamington. Uh, and I'm working really hard at the moment to try and get a university railway station. So we can get a railway station, um, uh, which would be on the line, the Leamington to Coventry line. Then students will be able to come, have the opportunity to take that choice, to come there as well, and then we will take responsibility for bringing people onto campus. If we can push really hard on that, it will, of course, um, alleviate some of the pressure on the bus companies and it might make them think a little bit more about competition and service to the people who are paying some money because um, it's quite hard to get them to focus on, on that at the moment. There's a number of other things we try and do around around transport but the rail station is important in and of itself but also because it'll help us put some pressure on those uh, on those companies. Um, it's uh, Some people when I say this I say oh well you know what about next year this is like 10 years away. It's not necessarily a long way away because the the opportunity if we can get people to support us on this for the, the railway station is because of the HS2 build. Um, and start, the HS2 build basically starts next year. So there's an opportunity for us to really be able to push on this very, very quickly. But I think even talking about it is helpful in terms of being able to say to the bus companies, you know, that frankly you want to face more competition. Nevertheless, I promise you, <laughs> and the SU will promise as well, there are lots of meetings and discussions and negotiations about their business model. Maybe I'll explain it again. Or, so on the issue of mental health now, so with student suicide being on the rise at national level, do you think that universities should be doing more to target these issues of mental health at university? And what do you think work specifically should be doing in this regard? So I'll take the second bit first. Uh, so we put more investment into um, the mental health provision support. Um, we are doing a lot of work at the moment around suicide safe universities in terms of where we stand, what our strategy is. Um, what's clear I think from that work is that we've got lots of different areas of activity but we need to bring it together, this is a piece of work with the SU, into one clear visible um, uh, strategy that we can uh, adopt. We have somebody new who's coming to oversee that, who's got a lot of experience within the sector but also beyond the sector. So I think that there's, there's um, a lot of um, a lot of work in terms of strategy, more investment, but also <coughs> we need to work collaborative, so that takes the first part of your question, we need to do a lot more work collaborative, Universities UK have done a lot of work in this area as you well know, um, partly of course coming out of terrible series of events at Bristol University, um, and we're part of that, uh, engage very much with them, uh, looking in particular to listen and learn what other people are doing, 
because um, of course the last thing we want is each individual university to start you know, reinventing the wheel itself. There's lots of good practice out there that we can learn from and engage with. So I think there's a lot of work, it's an ongoing um, process. If I may say, I think the Minister's contributions haven't been terribly helpful. Um, the Minister's contributions about Minister for Universities, about <coughs> this is the primary purpose of universities. Um, it's not the primary purpose of universities, but it's a really important part of being a university and supporting students. The primary purpose of universities, of course, is around education and research. There may be things that we can learn from other sectors as well. Uh, and I think that's one of the other interesting things in the Universities UK work is, is looking at uh, other sectors and possibly even other countries. I think the fundamental problem is that, that nobody yet has an, an extremely clear explanation of why it is that the mental health of child, or at least an uncontested, straightforward explanation of why it is that the mental health challenges of, of contemporary student generations are increasing so long. Um, and that's a fundamental piece of research work I think that we and other universities are doing. Rob. Um, so next year, Cryfield Village is opening up to students as a new accommodation block, and it's the third new accommodation block since 2010 after Bluebell and Sherborne. And all three of these seem to be on the higher end of the accommodation spectrum in terms of price. And uh, Cryfield Village is replacing Redford, which was one of the cheaper accommodations. So does the university plan in the future to open any more accommodation options that are on the lower end in terms of price for students, given the cost of living? Uh, possibly. Um, but I think one of the things that we're doing, so two really important things. One, we do have our ladder of rents. And our ladder of rents is really important and it's something that we uh, discuss and negotiate in a lot of detail over the course of every year. And in that ladder of rents, uh, what you'll find is that across the Russell Group, we have uh, a, the largest number of low rent accommodation across the whole Russell Group. So we are looking absolutely to protect that part of, as it were, the market as well. The other thing though that's really important is we have to look where student demand is. And actually student demand is at the top end. Um, and it's absolutely important, absolutely the case that we've got to provide options for all students. But there's just increasing demand at that top level. Um, students seem to like one sweet bathrooms, a bit of space, and a little bit of comfort all around and all the rest of it. And, 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 I, and I don't say that <coughs> in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of pejorative way. It, it's just what we are being told because that's what people are opting for. So, um, to a certain extent, what we're doing is, is, is really just reacting to that, that student demand. Or, um, so we'd also like to ask you about uh, student accommodation. So, um, at the beginning of this academic year, SU President Liam Jackson turned the uh, term to the university struggle with student accommodation, uh, with students being housed in Feldon Conference Centre and more sharing rooms than usual as a crisis. Um, last year, after the university experienced problems with accommodation, you told the board that you felt that the university had over-provided to make sure you would not experience the same problems again. So what would you say was the issue this year? And do you think the university overstretched itself? So this is a really big issue. Um, let's go back to last year before we come to this year. So the question about last year was very much about a total provision, so including postgraduates, including off-campus. And what we had done last year is to over-provide in terms of the nomination agreements that we have with private sector providers. So that in particular for postgraduates, there was absolutely going to be a guarantee there somewhere. So come to this year. Um, so this year, we didn't have a crisis. And I think, to be fair, if you ask Liam again now, I think he would say, we didn't have a crisis. What we did is we planned credentially for what might happen if larger numbers of students turned up than we thought we would. So Felder, for example, we haven't used. But we took something, so took some decisions to say, we will take this away from the conference centre were it to be the case that we needed that additional um, um, combination. So, so let's just have a moment, if I may, think about student numbers, because this is a really important part of the whole, the whole process, and of course the other part of what it was that uh, Liam was quoting the board saying. We had last year um, an extraordinary change. We had more student applications at the university than ever before. And we had more student applications in every single category, so more undergraduate, more postgraduate, more British, more rest of the European Union, more international. Uh, in the postgraduate master space, we had a 25% increase in applications. So the first part of this process, we want to be open, we want to have fair access to students, but we've also got to manage those numbers. The first part of this process was to try to take that enormous increase in demand and turn it into something manageable. I think we did that pretty well because by the time we got to um, the welcome week, in, in terms of undergraduate numbers, we were 0.2% over the target that we'd set. By the time we come to the end of Welcome Week, and the end of Week 1, that had increased to 4% over. So 
that we had a large number of students coming after, saying they're going to come, actually turning up after we would normally expect people to turn up. And, and, and again, there was an increase also on the postgraduate side. So one of the things that's also happening is that student behaviour is changing. It's less predictable. And a lot of the algorithms that we've set to try to work out and make sure that we land as close as possible to our target are needing to be looked at again. And we've got a project looking at that, um, that this year. Going over target is a problem as well as going under target. It really is a problem. So we are trying to land on the numbers that we set and we plan for. Uh, and as a consequence of that, we're trying to work very clearly to make sure that we do um, give the accommodation that we say that we'll give to the students. But there wasn't a crisis this year. You know, what, what, what you collectively picked up on is all the preparation planning were we to be in a more difficult position. Um, did I answer all the bits of your question? I, I'm not sure I did. Was another piece that I haven't answered? Um, I said, do you think? Uh, I said, so what do you think went wrong in terms of provision, and do you think the university outstretched itself? Oh, okay. So, so um, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> Raw. Last year, the university had a number of issues with racist, sexist, and offensive language being used by students, the most common of which was a private Facebook group incident. Do you think the university's response to these issues has been successful? What does more need to be done? So let me not comment about the specific case, because obviously the specific case is, uh, is a specific case, and there are a sense of process and confidentiality around that. Is there more to be done? Yes, there is. Uh, is there more for the university to do? Yes. Actually, is there more for us to do as a community? I think, I think there probably is. So one of the things that we've tried to do this year, university and, and SU, is to set up much clearer messaging about what is and isn't acceptable behaviour. Right at the front, so um, maybe you'll remember at the start of the first year, there's a big meeting, everyone gets called to, and you get addressed. We tried, to, both Leo and I have tried to be very clear in that, that this sort of behaviour we're talking about is not going to be accepted. And we've tried to collect collectively, ourselves at the university and the SU, to use the Welcome Week as a whole week to communicate some, some things about behaviour. Um, it's quite difficult because you will all know there's sets of people who want to say, what about my freedom of speech? I have the right to say. Um, and we're not trying to say, obviously, freedom of speech is to be overruled. But what we're asking people to do is to be sensitive about the impact of what they say and how they say it on other people. Uh, and I think in some of the cases that we've seen, um, that hasn't been considered very carefully. We need to do more messaging. Uh, one of the pieces of work for this year that as a university we're doing is developing what we're calling our inclusion strategy. Um, uh, and of course there's, there's elements of that which is about widening participation. Um, there's elements about that also which is with regard to how we operate as an organisation, gender pay gap for example is too part here. Um, but a lot of that is also about how we communicate, how we work as a community together um, and how we try to think before we speak when we might think that actually some ways we speak will be deeply offensive and unacceptable to, to some of our community. Or, so on the same issue of the group chat, was many students were of course horrified at the content of the group chat incident at the end of the last academic year. Uh, concerns were raised that the context was a private conversation, thus an invasion of privacy to display in the media. Uh, so do you think that a private group chat should be the subject of media attention? So again, let me not comment on the specific case, but take the general point that, that you're making. Um, um, how can I do that? <laughs> let me think carefully how I do that. Um, uh, of course, part of the issue is um, private chat becoming public. Um, and private chat becoming public is something, frankly, that everyone should always think about. Private chat very rarely stays private chat. Um, being very old uh, and talking to people who are as old as me, um, we sat around last year and talked about, do you remember conversations of that sort in the park? Because there wasn't social media. Can you imagine such a day there wasn't social media? Um, and, and frankly, when people would say <coughs> some of these sorts of things, there'd be someone to say, don't, you mustn't, don't, why have you thought about, that's terrible. And, and, and some of these um, private uh, social media spaces kind of amplify things and there are people who are going to check. But, but frankly, uh, anybody who assumes that any kind of um, social media isn't going to become public is deluding themselves. It's always only a matter of time. Um, none of these things are ever going to stay private because it involves people. So I think that the, um, the distinction, in a sense, is quite a false one. Um, if you won't say something in public, maybe don't say it in private, because 
maybe it's going to become public, and maybe you should be consistent about who you are, and being authentic as a person. Raw. Um, this is sort of connected to your last question where you brought up freedom of speech, but um, there's been some concerns in the media about freedom of speech on campus and the kind of opinions people are allowed to um, express on campus in terms of no platforming. So what are your views about no platforming and what place, if any, it has on campus in these societies? So, so um, legally, as a university, we have a, an absolute requirement to allow freedom of speech through the Education Act. Um, repeated through subsequent acts, we have an absolute requirement to allow freedom of speech. So that will happen. There will be uh, opportunities for people to give freedom of speech. But, and this is the important part of your question, but it is really important as a community, if somebody is coming and putting forward views that the community as a whole feel are objectionable, we should find ways for the community to be able to say that. I would love people to think when they're inviting people what will be the impact of some of those invitations upon members of our community? To have that thought, it is quite linked to that, to that previous uh, conversation. So this is not about preventing people from coming to speak, but it's absolutely about the context in which people speak and the context in which people are invited. And were it to be the case that somebody with particularly um, extreme and radical views about um, the personal behaviour of, or indeed identity, who are members of this community is absolutely right as a community and indeed as a university, which is saying what it is that we stand for. It's not stopping the freedom of speech, but it's saying there's another really powerful point of view as well. Or um, so moving on to free speech, um, no, sorry, free speech to society initiations. Mm. So um, the death of the student at uh, Newcastle University during society initiation processes. Um, is making headlines again um, and has revived concern around the issue of uncontrolled society initiations at universities. Um, in 2014, uh, the Men's Rugby Union Society at the University of Warwick was banned um, for allegedly dangling a student off of the terrace bar during initiations. Um, in regards to initiation processes at Warwick, the SU must approve initiations, uh, as we understand it, which can also be referred to as adoptions at Warwick. Um, Yet we still hear quite horrific stories of students being placed in danger or compromising situations. Do you think that universities should introduce more guidelines into these events that can possibly end in serious harm? So I don't hear, and this is a really important point in terms of media engagement, I don't hear about what you've just said in this university. And if there are stories about what is happening to students in this context at this university, they absolutely have to be serviced. It's, it's not good enough to keep them within societies. Because the sorts of things that we're seeing uh, being revealed at the moment um, are unacceptable. Now, exactly as you say, the SU takes the lead on this, it's the SU societies. Um, so, as you say, the, the SU uh, has a process not only of um, agreeing what these processes would be, but also of trying to engage to educate the clubs and societies before they get to that point. And that's been a long, on, ongoing process of work actually well before 2014 that the SU have led on this. What I see and hear at the moment, I feel that is working well. If there is evidence that it's not, that really must be surfaced because that, that, that is something that must be challenged. But I think the SU is doing a really good job in this space. Um, I think it is for us as a university to say, uh, and for me to say, that the sorts of things we're reading about at the moment at the universities is absolutely unacceptable. But if there's more for us to do, um, then it would be because the SU, I think at this point, would be asking us to do more, and I think they feel they've got some control on it. So if there are other stories, it's a, it's a really important appeal that they really need to be served. Rob, last year we asked you about issues with the lack of study spaces on campus, and since then the university has introduced a number of measures, such as an app to check the availability of such study spaces. Do you think this has resolved the issue, or can more, can more be done? More can be done. More will be done. Uh, in two contexts. One is, is um, there's a lot of work ongoing, and again, this is a really good area of, of collaboration between the university and the SU to identify additional spaces that we can make available as study spaces. Um, but I think the other thing is that we need to think very carefully about how we are planning the future space development for, for the university in the future um, in terms of making sure there's, there's a better provision of study space in our new buildings going forward. So we're doing a, a, a big project at the moment on, um, on master planning, the, the university as a whole, looking forward to 2030 and beyond, and thinking about what, what the university might look like uh, in terms of its size and shape, and where new buildings might go, and what might go in those buildings, and, and thinking very hard 
what is the relationship between numbers of students and numbers of study spaces. One, one of the really uh, important things is that, again, student behaviour has changed over the last few years. And, and in the sense, universities like this had been called out by that, um, with, the, frankly, the, the transition from a lot more study individually in bedrooms into a lot more study as social activity, working with other people and learning together. Um, and, and trying to address that transition is what we've been doing at the moment. But embedding that transition into the build program for the future is this next piece of work. Four. Um, <clears throat> so with regards to the recent um, higher education equal pay dispute, 71% um, of those who returned their ballot papers at the University of Warwick, which equated to 261 members of staff, voted in favour of strike action. Um, however, the turnout was 36.1%, uh, thus not hitting the threshold. The UCU have expressed that they feel that this result and turnout exemplifies how trade union laws frustrate national support for strike action on pay. Do you agree, and do you think that more should be done at Warwick? Uh, no, I don't agree on that particular point. Um, I'll say more about Warwick at the moment. I don't agree on that particular point. 261 is not a very large number of people to come and vote for a strike which would have a uh, very significant impact, obviously, across um, students learning across the institution. Um, so I don't accept that point. Now, the broader point is about pay, uh, and the broader point is about pay levels. Uh, and, of course, this dispute has come about, and it's not just with the UCU, of course, um, because employers as a whole, it's a national pay bargaining scheme, employers as a whole were unable to come to an agreement with the trade unions, and so the offer of 2% was turned into an imposition of 2% pay, the pay rise for this year. 2% is um, not my wildly different to uh, inflation, but it is. Uh, and the, if the unions were sitting here, they would say, don't just look at that in isolation, look at what's happened over the last several years. And that is absolutely a reasonable perspective to take. The problem that we've got at the moment is that there is massive uncertainty across the whole of higher education. There's uncertainty because of Brexit uh, and what will be the financial implications of Brexit as well as all the other really important concerns about Brexit. I hope someone's going to ask about Brexit. Um, if not, let me say something at the end. Um, <coughs> we've had the pensions dispute. Now, a, a resolution to the pensions dispute will be more expensive for employers, so there's additional cost that's going to go there as well. And then we also have running alongside this uh, the review that the government has commissioned by Philip Orger to look at um, fee levels and funding for universities. If you add those together and you say each of those might have financially negative consequences, there absolutely are universities in this country that are worrying about becoming bankrupt. This is not what. This is not what. Um, and so we have a stretch now where uh, the size and effectiveness of some universities mean and things like pay, <coughs> we could pay more. But we have other institutions that are frankly going to really struggle to pay that 2%. So we have a stretch and it's of course exactly what you'd expect in a more marketized system. Some institutions are doing better, some institutions are doing worse. And while you have a national bargaining scheme, a national agreement scheme, you're always going to compromise somewhere in the middle of that, and probably actually towards the lower end because there are real jobs at that risk at that lower end. So that's the context in, in, in which we're operating. Some of those uh, risks and challenges will be clearer before next year's pay round emerges. But they might not be clear in a positive way in terms of university finances. Um, so this is an issue which is simply not going to go away, I think, over the next, uh, next few years, probably. Well, and um, so this is linked to these strikes. So the university currently has an opt-in policy for lecture capture, and in September, uh, Warwick UCU urged lecturers to opt out of lecture capture because they fear that in the future um, the university could use their recordings to break future strikes. So what role do you think lecture capture has in the university, and how can the university balance the desires of students for lecture captures with concerns by lecturers about future use? So uh, strike breaking is illegal and unacceptable. Let's move from there. Mm -hmm. It's not about strike breaking. Um, we believe that lecture capture is really important, <laughs> it's really, really valuable. Um, the, all the feedback we get from, um, uh, from students is it's really important and really, really valuable. So we want to continue to, to support and to develop that. Um, don't agree with UCU on this point. Um, and my point to UCU on this point is actually the scale of the um, uh, strike that they were able to bring about was simply not negated by people having on some of their courses, 
available for the whole year material from lecture capture. Um, I don't actually know how we would go about anyway. I presume we would be taking lecture capture down at the start of the year just in case. I don't know practically how we would go about doing this. But the principle is the important thing. The principle is lecture capture is important and valuable. We want to support more opt-in. Um, and I don't believe that it is really ever going to have a material effect negatively upon strike action. Or, um, on the same issue of strikes, <laughs> going back to our previous question, why do you think that a low number of staff return their ballot paper? Do you think, do you, would you see this as voting fatigue on behalf of staff? No, I think a lot of staff actually understand that wider context of the financial position, uh, and that it's very hard to see um, a radical change in the pay position before the pensions position is resolved. So for the, um, the, the 67 uh, universities who were involved with the USS dispute at the moment, um, the scale of money that might be involved in keeping that system alive is potentially phenomenal. So very technically, but very, very briefly, um, because at the moment there is no agreed position by the employers and the unions to go forward to the USS trustees, the USS trustees have invoked their emergency mechanism and their emergency mechanism is about essentially making sure that uh, employers and employees are contributing enough to keep the system alive. Nobody wants to see the pension scheme crash in the way that other pension schemes have crashed. But that means that for employers, whereas currently we're, we have been paying 18% of somebody's salary into the pension, that will increase to 24.9% over the course of the next 18 months. That 6 plus percent of extra costs is going to be, depending on the size of the university, uh, 7 to 10 million pounds extra. That's a lot of extra money that's going to come out of budgets which haven't been budgeted before. And I think people know that. Uh, people who were voting, of course, were people who are paying a lot of it, or not voting. Um, people who had the opportunity to vote are people who paid a lot of attention to the pensions dispute, uh, are, are very well aware of the sums of money that are involved, depending on how this work results and works out. And I think, therefore, we're actually quite, quite a knowledgeable electorate. So I think it's a lot of that context which is important as well. Which is, of course, another reason why it's so important that we get to a resolution, an acceptable resolution that protects benefits on pensions over the course of the next few months. Well, car park 7 next to Senate House is being demolished in January. How does the university expect to cope with the loss of these parking spaces, especially for visitors to the Arts Centre? Uh, so we've got a new car park going up just uh, just over there, which is about um, trying to provide some support. <coughs> of course, the car park is coming down as part of the bill for the, um, the new arts the faculty, which is an amazing building, a great investment. Of it. And I hope that people will see it as a, as a really massive uh, vote of confidence in arts and humanities in this university in the future. So there is going to be additional uh, car parking space. Um, we are, in the moment, just about to go to uh, Coventry City Council's planning department for our hybrid planning application, which will give us the opportunity to have more car parking spaces. Um, the residents, you will know, are concerned. Uh, and therefore, because there are elected officials on that planning committee, they are alert to those concerns. So there's a lot of issues for us to resolve around this at the moment in collaboration with our neighbours and the, and the city council. But short answer, uh, one, car parking put up there, two, planning application to put more uh, space together, three, uh, looking to how we, in terms of that master plan work, have actually fewer cars <coughs> in the centre of campus. And more um, uh, the, imposite, the introduction of um, electric and ideally autonomous pods that will help people get around. I don't know whether some of you might have seen some of the testing that's been going on um, around uh, Academic Square. If we can get ourselves to a point where we can push cars out, we ha can have those autonomous and electric vehicles bringing people across and the train station. This would make a massive difference to the to the uh, to the life that we all have here on the campus. Or oh. okay, we'd like to give uh, you a chance to talk about Brexit. Now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so part of the role of uh, vice chancellor, as we understand it, is to secure a financial basis for the university. Uh, do you think this will struggle in the face of Brexit? Uh, so Brexit is a disaster. It could be a catastrophe, uh, and the catastrophe option, of course, is the no deal option. Because uh, in a catastrophe option, a no deal option, everything falls apart, everything falls away. So what do I mean by that? Um, uh, in terms of those research projects that a lot of people have around the university, £16 million a year comes from Europe and spent on research, which hires a lot of people, so a lot of jobs are dependent on that, uh, would be absolutely at risk. The government says it will put some money in for the short term, 
but we're looking for the medium term. We have people on longer term contracts than between here and 2020. So that's a, a massive, you asked the financial question, that's a massive challenge. We don't know, of course, what the position will be in terms of fees for students from the rest of the European Union um, come 2020. That's a major challenge. Um, uh, people in and around government say it will be okay because we can just charge international fees. I don't want to do that. I want to keep the same basis because um, we have fabulous, fabulous numbers of students coming from the European Union and we want to support that. And we know in some programs there are higher proportions of students in the European Union than others, so we want to maintain that balance. That would be a risk from, from that which is going forward. Um, from Rasmus, sure. Just go in there. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, the, the no deal catastrophe scenario is, of course, in terms of Erasmus, Peter's quite right to pick this up. We absolutely have commitments to students to go on their Erasmus exchanges. Those uh, exchange agreements fall away in a no deal scenario. We absolutely will honour every single one of those. But it'll be anomaly hard to put that together, and there'll be a lot of resources that we'll need to put in to staffing to redevelop those legal relationships with all of our partners in order to make sure that happens uh, in this period as well. So there are lots of knock-on consequences. If you come away from no deal into hard Brexit, those consequences are not quite as bad, but they're pretty terrible. They are pretty terrible. Apologies to anybody who supports Brexit in this room, because um, you're not going to hear anything very nice for the next couple of minutes. So we absolutely are facing major financial challenges, and there could be enormous financial challenges. But of course, um, that's not the main problem. That's a subsidiary problem. The main problem is about the relationships that we have as a university and that we have as a community with the rest of Europe. We're a European country, we're a European university. We cannot have those connections broken or even put at risk, frankly, by, by what the government is doing at the moment. I keep looking at Peter because he doesn't want me to go too far. <laughs> I can go on a long time about, a long, long time about this. So we have to take every opportunity that we can to maintain and support our, um, our relationships as a university with uh, other, other European institutions. And at the moment, we're working very hard at putting together an application for a European university network, formerly called a Macron network, which is about trying to get uh, a relatively small number of universities to work much more closely together, particularly around education. So around mobility, around joint programs, actually about learning from each other. We all set up our student unions in different ways. We all set up our societies in different ways. Actually, ours is there learning across different universities and different countries that we can get together on, uh, and also to have opportunities to build those long-term those long-term relationships as well. So we're taking some. That's just the most immediate example. countervailing measures to try to deal with this because the fundamental problem, although financial is a worry, the fundamental problem is we are a European university and we have to stay part of Europe. Now, I wasn't too bad at it. Too much. We could name the first three partners. So, so, so yes. So um, the first partners in this um, are uh, a university called Paris Saint. So in the north of Paris, um, uh, which is a conglomeration of a number of institutions. What the French are doing at the moment is they're putting a lot of their universities, higher education institutes, and grand école together into these new super institutions. Paris Saint um, is the one that we are partners with. They came to visit us and asked us to collaborate, and we've also already got some some joint fellowships working with them. The second is the Free University of Brussels. Um, we, we know from, from students, Brussels is a great location to go. We we're looking to have a joint institute with them. We're looking to have joint programs with them as well as uh, student abilities. There are research programs in both uh, spaces. Um, and we've also now got an agreement with Ljubljana University of Slovenia, which uh, helps us uh, as a university really connect into the Western Balkans, um, which is going to be a really important part of Europe in the next few years, next decade certainly. Um, and Ljubljana also is, is, is highly ranked. Um, very international, very, very outward looking, and, and, a, and again, a great place actually to have collaboration in terms of joint programs and student mobility and so on. Um, and we're looking ideally to get a couple more in that network um, across different parts of Europe as well, so we've got a genuine network. It will not replace full membership of the European Union, because nothing can replace full membership of the European Union, um, but it is something we can commit ourselves to to uh, be part of mitigating uh, activities in terms of European identity. We're all um, sort, of a, sort of a similar question there. So in the short term, um, if there is a no-deal Brexit in March next year, obviously there'll be students, presumably on Erasmus, but also just from Europe, um, at the university at that time. So is, is, is the university planning to reach out to them and any support that they may need in case of no-deal Brexit with uncertainty around how their status so, would be so, affected? So, so firstly, um, anybody on an exchange, we absolutely will honour that. Absolutely will honour that. Um, how 
we do that, frankly, is the subject of quite a lot of work at the moment in a no-deal scenario, but we absolutely will honour that. Um, uh, uh, the position of students from the European Union who are here in terms of their study will not change under a no-deal scenario. And we will make absolutely sure that government hears that and says that. Of course, we're not alone in this. You know, the Rossi Group is absolutely united on this. The University of UK is absolutely united on this. Uh, so there's a very strong voice in that space. Where government has moved in terms of settled status for people from the EU, um, it's not ideally where I wanted it to go, but there is a clear guarantee that people can stay in the country now. Um, the government has said that in their phase just upcoming, people who work at universities will be given a, a privileged route to get to there. Uh, we've committed to put over £350,000 into supporting applications from members of staff and their families and including any tax penalty that they might otherwise face to get that settled status to help support people know that they are wanted here, uh, that we have a commitment to them here, and, and despite whatever is going on at government level in terms of who we are as a community, people from other European Union countries are absolutely full members of it. Four. Um, <clears throat> so with what you just said about, uh, what you just said to us about um, potential rising tuition fees, um, as a result of Brexit, do you think that the service delivered by universities could still be deemed value for money, should tuition fees rise? What, what would you describe as value for money? So, for the, the service provided by universities, is it going to improve along with the increasing tuition fees, or are students just going to be paying more for exactly what they could have got? The, 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 reason, the reason I ask the question, of course, is, is, is because value for money is interpreted oh, in yes, different ways, because, yes. uh, and, and, and in particular, of course, um, the, the, the university's minister and, and, and British government as a whole seems to see value for money uh, purely in terms of the salary that somebody gets after five years. Now, actually, of course, um, in terms of the Warwick data, um, we score very highly in that because we have brilliant people who do brilliant things and they go on and do very, and are very successful. But I don't want to accept that as the value for money um, definition, to be honest. Um, I think the value for money definition is much more about the journey that you are all on as people here arriving and then graduating, who do you become, what do you learn, what are the networks you develop, how do you, how do you experiment with who you are, becoming, doing things like this in clubs and societies, that's, a really, that's the real value to you as people, I hope, um, as well as good degrees, as well as good jobs afterwards. And I really want to put that front and central. And I wanted to ask you, I wanted to ask you what you meant for it in order really as a device to say that. Because if we lose that uh, as universities, then we are completely commodified. Um, and we don't want to be completely commodified. So just to wind back, what I was trying to say was, government has the opportunity not to turn um, to people, students, in a few years' time coming from France, and say universities are required to, to treat you exactly the same as people from the rest of the world. Government has the opportunity to do that. Or government can say, actually, somebody from France has to be treated like somebody from the rest of the world. My preference is that uh, for students coming from Europe, because we're a European community, we should all be treated in the same way. Um, I don't have much confidence that this government at this time shares that view. I'm not talking about general increases before the front page comes out. I'm not talking about general increase in fees across the piece. Yeah, indeed, we mentioned the fees review earlier, the fees might actually potentially fall that review, and the question would be where we get the resource to sustain that. And, uh, don't be to say about that. So, so, so there is this... Um, big review that the Board is putting on at the moment, um, which, which clearly comes out of the Labour Party's offer to turn uh, fees uh, to zero. In fact, of course, the Labour Party position is more sophisticated than that, because what they're saying is the student doesn't pay, the state will pay. Um, and, and we know that that's, of course, the system that's used in many other countries, and it's going to cost them, including uh, their commitments on maintenance grants, 11 billion. So, so where there are concerns about that is, is obviously, firstly, where is that 11 billion going to come from? But that's what he's asked of every single opposition. And the second thing is um, the experience of universities through the 80s and the 90s, when there was a system where government paid everything, was that each year um, there wasn't quite the inflation increase. So over a period of 20 years, the unit teaching resource radically declined, which is part of the argument that uh, moved towards the fees regime. Not arguing in favour of that, just describing where we are. So that people then say to the Labour Party, well, they're saying 11 billion, you might find it now, but, but what happens in 2025, what happens in 2030? And I think actually they've got quite good answers to that. I think they've got quite good. If, if 
you accept they can get the money, <laughs> if you can get yourself into that door, I think they've got quite good answers when you go from there. In contrast, government has set up um, a review which uh, is looking at the whole of post-18 education. I think that's a really good thing. You know, why would you look at higher education in one space and further education in a different space, and indeed uh, apprenticeships in, in yet another space? So I think that is a good idea. But a lot of things that are coming from government at the moment is that money will be cut from the headline fee for universities, and some of that money will be moved across to other parts of further education. And the money, therefore, that is cut from fees will not be made up by, uh, by government teaching grants. Um, if that's the case, uh, depending on the scale of it, there, there are major financial implications for, for universities. Uh, so one number that floats around, none of this is, of course, guaranteed. All this goes through the political process. Everything can change. The one number that is being floated around at the, at the moment is 6,500 pounds. Uh, student pays 6,500 pounds through the student loan company yeah, with whatever repayment arrangement they agree for after that. But, but universities do not get the fee made up from 6,500 to 9,250, and indeed 6,500 is their flat line. So over time, as inflation increases, the value of that declines. That will have a massive financial implication for universities. And for universities that are very heavily dependent financially on undergraduate British and European students in terms of their finances, it could have a catastrophic impact. Because if you're suddenly losing a third of your income, it's quite hard to imagine how you're going to cope with that. As a university, we're in a very different place. Um, so only half of our income comes from all student fees. Um, and, and so that which would be effective would be much smaller, so you know, we are certainly not facing any kind of existential threat, but of course it would mean that we'd have to reschedule quite a lot of our plans were we to be in that kind of, that kind of position. So that fear that a lot of universities have at the moment is immediate about what the Organ Report might do and what government might do with it, much more so than what the Labour Party is saying. And I think that's a hundred percent different from the start last year, where lots of universities were worried about what the late party was saying, and not so much what the government was saying. And it could all change again in a year. Rob, um, so you sort of mentioned earlier sort of how universities had another rise in sort of applications and students entering. Um, sort of moving forward and moving to decades ahead, um, how does the university sort of seek to respond to any strain that might place on infrastructure? communities on the sort of university buildings and the parks themselves. How does the university plan on approaching the sort of continuing rise in the sort of or continuing growth of the student body? Yeah, it's a great, it's a really, really important question. It's really um, important at the moment because we're doing that master planning work. And that master planning work um, will enable us to say what would we need to do were we to get to about a 40% increase by 2030. That is not a plan to get to 40% that is saying what kind of capacity would we need to build. Now, on the campus, um, it's relatively straightforward because actually we have quite a, a lot of land. Quite a lot of the conversation with students and staff has said, you know, it's kind of a bit too spread out at the moment. You know, if we could create a little bit more of a kind of central district, um, that would be quite convenient and it would also help if you're doing interdisciplinary degrees and we want more people to do interdisciplinary degrees. So we can see on campus how we can do that. The big question is, I think, the transport policy around it, how to get people onto and away from uh, campus, and how do we do that in a way that doesn't really impact negatively on, on our neighbours. Um, and I think there are a number of dimensions to this that we're working on. So one is the train station, we talked about before. Um, a second one is the, the possibility of a relief road, which would run alongside the HS2 line. Um, ideally, it is using all of the land which has currently already been Necessarily purchased by HS2, so nobody else has to lose any land. Um, but HS2 have bought that because, of course, they need to get their trucks up and down while they're building the, the, the rail line. So, if we can use their truck lane effectively, it will mean we'll have a new entrance way to the university. It won't go past anybody, anybody's homes. And we can open all that up to, thirdly, what we were talking about before keeping cars out there and around campus, thinking about much more um, forward looking, autonomous electric vehicles for those people who need mobility needs to get across the campus. And, and then fourthly, we're also working on um, a uh, light rail option to get from the university to uh, Coventry Rail Station, and then from Coventry Rail Station to hospital, particularly for medical students and medical staff. 
and that's a project that is being run by, by WMG. Country City Council put quite a bit of money into it. Uh, local Enterprise Partnership put quite a lot of money into it. I call it a tram, I'm told very old fashioned. And this tram um, is, is fantastic because it's incredibly light. The, the materials are very light. And not only is it very light, they, they found a ways of spreading the, the weight, which means basically you don't have to dig up the roads. And if you don't have to dig up the roads, you can actually build it very quickly. And you can build it relatively cheaply. So that's one of the big projects we're working on as well. So uh, trying to produce an integrated transport strategy, which will take time to do, but has a rail station, has a new entrance way to the university where cars can be kept with around and have the light rail option is a way of increasing the capacity of people getting onto uh, this university campus uh, without impacting upon all of our, our neighbours. And indeed, were we in this context to be able to take Jimmy Hill Road and take vehicles off it altogether, this would be a massive, this would be a massive step forward. Um, and of course, all those transport options actually hopefully are in the interests of our neighbours as well, because they could use it as well, and they could get the advantages from that as well. So that transport piece is massively important. And we know that without doing something like that anyway, we're not only going to be limited in terms of what we can do on the campus, but frankly, we're going to be limited in terms of how many more students can live in Lenten. For three since you were asking earlier on. Or, um, where do you see the university in five years' time? And do you still see yourself as vice chancellor? Uh, yes, to the second part. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I could give you a, a really kind of um, nervous answer, because we don't know about Brexit, and we don't know about fees and all the rest of it, but actually I think we can be much more confident now. Um, because although these sorts of things are really going to cut across us in different ways, actually the direction of travel of the institution is, is a really positive one. Um, I think we're also becoming a little bit more at ease with ourselves as an institution. That's really important. Think about ourselves as a community. Um, I think we're doing a lot more listening. There's more to be done, but we're doing a lot more listening. So we can see that the, the courses that we are offering are really, really popular. And that's a great place to be. Um, I think that what we're doing in terms of the work and education strategy is evolving those courses with student input. That co-creation is a massively important part of it. Quite a listen, quite hard to student voice. NSS is only a small part of that, of course. Um, not only in terms of, of, of content, so there's a, a lot of work on decolonizing the curriculum going on, which is fantastic, and not in a um, confrontational space. Because actually, decolonizing the curriculum is simply saying, who are the really important people who've done things that aren't on the reading list at the moment? I'm just snapping any questions. It's a really, very big threat. Um, building further the popularity of our education and making more interdisciplinary. I think that's a really important uh, future driver for us. But one of the other things I think we're going to be able to build much more in terms of the education is much more in terms of undergraduate research opportunities. So being much clearer about when people are learning what is at the research forefront in their courses, but also giving um, students more opportunity for their own research to be heard. I think our research is is growing and being very successful. I mean, last year we had the highest ever uh, research income we've had for, for, for the university, which is a fantastic thing. Um, but it's not just the financial input, it's of course the product that comes out of it as well. Research excellence framework is in a couple of years' time. We're doing work with departments at the moment to see where everybody stands. There's fabulous work going on. I mean, the, the last few years, the, the, the quality and the international impact of the research work at the university is really, really fantastically strong. So I think we can be really confident. And the other thing is um, the acceptance and support for this university in our region maybe, maybe has never been greater. Maybe. Um, and, and partly it's because we're, we're of a size where we are a major employer uh, and we have characteristics of ourselves as an employer that people really appreciate. So as an employer, we don't do zero hours contracts. As an employer, we, have, we pay living wage foundation rates. And as an employer, we will not do outsourcing. So, so those are all sorts of things, again, in terms of commitment to the university, to our community around us that are, that are really appreciated. And I think these are really on incredibly strong uh, foundations, despite nonsense around us. So one minute to ten, so the last question from the board, or from the Royal Sun. Um, a similar question to before about um, growth of student population. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about the transport length and what the university do to address that. But obviously, um, with the new Cryfield Village, I think that it expands accommodation by about 500 or so. So in the next few years, that's uh, probably going to end up being a few hundred people moving into Leamington Spa. So how is the university working at all with Leamington to cope with yeah. potential student influx? Yeah, yeah, we're working very hard with, with, with Leamington, working very hard. Um, so with the district council, with the county council, um, and with the MP. So all, all 
all of these conversations are going on at the moment. We're also doing a, a, a big review of accommodation provision in Leamington. Um, not all landlords are really equal, shall we say. Um, and so uh, a process of um, making that clearer <laughs> is ongoing at the moment, uh, which is really important. So, so there's a lot of work in Leamington that is going to be a limitation in the immediate few years on how many additional students can live in Leamington for all those market conditions reasons. So the other thing is Coventry. So Coventry has an enormous range of very high quality accommodation at the moment. Our experience is that um, that accommodation is, is very popular with postgraduates and is very popular with international undergraduates. And what we'd like to do with the SU is to be able to um, share and show the great advantages of some accommodation place with more undergraduate students over the course of the next few years. I mean, Coventry is the 39th most popular student city in the world. Um, and, and it is, you will all know, uh, quite an interesting place. City so, of Culture. Well. City of Culture coming up in 21, City of Sport next year. I mean, lots of great things going on, actually. So I think developing um, a, a, a different um, demographic, as it were, in, in Coventry accommodation is another part of that process in, the, in that sort of short to medium term. Um, beyond that, you know, we do need to have um, a much fuller conversation about uh, how much accommodation on campus, who provides the accommodation on campus, precisely the point that you made about ladder of rents. One of the reasons that we've always resisted having um, private sector provision is because private sector on campus is because private sector provision on most campuses is really, really super expensive. Um, but now we're having people come to us from the private sector and saying, you know, we would put up uh, accommodation, we would take the responsibility, but we would put up um, accommodation at different price points. And you know, we would take your ladder of, of rents and, and we would then build to that. If that's true, that's worth us having a, a conversation. It's really controversial, I know. It's something the university has never, never done, um, but that might be a conversation it's worth us all having in the future, as long as that ladder of rents is properly, as you asked first of all, is properly preserved. Well done. Thanks, folks. I'd like to ask you, you actually filled the R. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.